Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. The rise in participation of women and kids in both hunting and shooting sports has encouraged firearms manufacturers to produce rifles that offer out-of-the-box adjustability. One of the many reasons that I love Ruger firearms is that they manufacture rifles for everyone. Many models like this Ruger Hawkeye Long Range Hunter feature spacers that can be easily added or removed from the buttstock of the rifle, providing a comfortable fit and ease of use for all responsible citizens. I'm a proud Ruger American, and you should be too. Hey everybody, thank you for joining me for the Wild and Uncut podcast. I am at Hunt Expo with Trevor Marks from Bull Ridge Guide Service. Trevor, you're like, um... My husband's like Instagram, like bromance. I don't even know. Like he's always like, oh my gosh, did you see the video that Trevor posted? Did you see what Trevor did? Did you see the, I mean, it's like not like every day. Like we live vicariously through you is a thing. Well, I live vicariously through your husband. (laughs) (laughs) He gets to go all around the world. He's got, you know, some stories too. It's pretty cool. Listen to all the stuff that he's done too. Yeah. No, it's fun. Um, You... Yogi books a lot of hunts around the world with a lot of incredible outfitters, and I think you're one of his favorite humans. You're doing a lot of bear and mountain lion hunting, and also you're like the man for elk. I, I mean, I don't know if anybody draws a tag in Nevada, like they need to call Trevor because I, I think your your guys' average for killing 380 inch plus elk consistently on public land in Nevada is. I don't think it's second to none. Like, I don't know if there's a lot of people that do. There's just not a lot of people that do what you do in the woods. It's incredible. I mean, you're you're living out there 24-7. Yeah, and it's hard because, again, you don't want to brag or, you know, boost I'll brag for him, (laughs) okay? Trevor's a badass. (laughs) But, yeah, we've been pretty fortunate, you know, to kill a lot of big bulls, you know, a lot of the top bulls in Nevada. Mm -hmm. I think as a guide service, my dad and brother started it back in 96, and we've probably killed over 400 Nevada bulls on public land. That is unreal. You know. Like, yeah, so you guys are, proof is in the pudding. Like, if <laughs> your social media is, is off the chain. Um, so it, we're heading into, like, coming into, like, some spring bear, and then we're coming out of, you know, lion hunting. Um, you're running some dry ground stuff, too. There's a lot of people that have questions about hounds. Now, you're an outstanding houndsman. Can you talk some of the people through a little bit of, you know, what you're looking for in a dog? And obviously, you know, you're looking for different dogs with with mountain lions and bears. And, you know, I I went to a seminar the other day that Jana Waller did, and there was a lot of people that were asking, like, how how do I start a dog? You know, how do you teach a dog to stand on your truck and strike? You know, how do you get a dog to strike a bear? How do you do these things? You know, there's so many questions I have for you on all of this, on this dog training aspect, which can go in a whole rabbit hole. But do you have any good, like, solid tips for people with, you know, they're wanting to get into dogs. They're wanting to get into hunting with hounds. Yeah, I mean, to me, the biggest step we've seen is obviously your dog's history, its blood, you know, ones that just kind of naturally get it. You know, you can have a dog that, isn't quite there yet and get him there or you can have one that just clicks you know and at six months Mm -hmm. he's doing pretty much everything the older ones are Mm -hmm. you know a lot of our young dogs we turn them out and run them with the older dogs Mm -hmm. and see them kind of work their way around rocks or you know dry stuff and pick it through but and then other guys will do like a drag put some scent Mm -hmm. on a drag and drag it you Mm -hmm. know kind of work your dog that way and they sell coon scents coyote scents bobcat scent mountain lion scent like you can buy yep. pretty much any scent and when when he's talking about doing a scented drag it's urine like it 
it's yeah. like not nice. You don't want to get it on your hands. <laughs> like it is no. so sticky, uh, but very effective for training. Yeah. You know, but we've had dogs that didn't pick up on that, mm -hmm. but yet they'd pick up on, on the, the actual, stuff. yeah, the real mm -hmm. stuff, you know? And so like one of my earliest dogs probably clicked at three months. Wow. You know, he was Just running natural. with the other dogs. And then at six months, he actually a split race and took off on his own cat at six months, mm -hmm. you know, and the other ones had split and they had treated the other one and he took off by himself. So it was just, that was just one of the lucky ones that mm -hmm. naturally had it from the get go. And I think a lot of it too is however much time you put into your dog is what you're kind of going to get, out, get yeah. out of it as well. Exactly. You know, you have some that are naturally just outstanding hunters and then you have some that are slower starts, but really if you're not taking them out and hunting them, they're not going to get that opportunity to excel. Yep. You know, and like for us, like me, typically I like a smaller dog. Yeah. You know, lots of guys like bigger dogs, but the box is the way we have it set up to travel. Cause I have my snowmobile in my truck with my dog box. So my dog box is on top of the bed and I pull my sled in underneath. So I can't have too big a box or my sled won't fit in. So my dogs tend to be a little bit on the smaller side. Like 35 so can, pounds. Yeah. So I could fit them in that box, you know, comfortably. Mm -hmm. Or when we're carrying them, they're not a big hassle, you know, yeah. of a 70 pound, yeah. you know, black and tan or, you know, typically them ones run a little bit bigger, black and tan. So we got to. What, what type of dogs are you running? Um, English, red tick, blue tick, mainly what we run. We've got a few walkers too. Mm -hmm. Walkers tend to be a little bit bigger also. Yeah, they're a little lengthier, you yeah. know, and these blue ticks and red ticks that we got, like I said, are a little on the smaller side and mm -hmm. fit my needs, you know, for bears. We're just kind of getting into Nevada bears quite a bit. We come over here to Utah and run, you know, pursuit with some friends mm -hmm. every now and then. On the... Um on the ticks, are they more of, you know, stick their nose in the air and run like on a bear? Or are they more meticulous, pick and track to track like they would on a lion? Or is it just dependent on the dog? You dependent on the dog. You know, and again, for the most part, if it's fresh enough, you know, where they could just drift the scent. Yeah. They'll run with their nose up. But yeah, mine are more ground, mm -hmm. you know, taking track to track. So a little bit more efficient in the drier ground, going slower, mm -hmm. picking through. But then once you can get it jumped or fresh enough, then yeah, nose in the air and they're it, gone. The race is on. Yeah. One thing that is when you dump a dog box, it's on. Like they, whatever is happening has happened and it's too late to go back now. Like you're on the race and it's like a gong show. May or may not unfold. It's, it's done. Yeah. Do you have some dogs that you hold back? Do you have, I mean, do you have like a strategy? Like I know some guys, you know, on, you know, Bobcat, you'll want three or four dogs. You don't want eight dogs out there. You know, you want a smaller amount of dogs. And I mean, what is your, do you have like a number like, hey, you know, we like to run four dogs or eight dogs or some people like the more the dogs, the merrier if yep. they've got, you know, dry ground lions. Yeah. And some will do that. And I typically don't, even when we're running, even in good snow, you know, we don't really dump a whole lot. Mm -hmm. It's anywhere from three to seven, yeah. eight at most for us. You know, mainly if you're in that drier stuff, you don't want a dog that isn't on point. You know, yeah. if he's not really working, he's just there creating more chaos, yeah. you know, kind of following another dog. The yeah. other ones. You know, is where the other ones are trying to work and he's you know, just bumping into him mm -hmm. and not really doing his job, you know, and that's younger when they get older, obviously they'll pick it up better, but mm -hmm. I got a few younger ones now that I, when we get in the hard stuff, I'll keep them till we get, yeah. get a jumped and then I'll let them go. Once it's fresh and yep. you can, you can have them kind of build confidence in a controlled manner yep, exactly. to the best of your ability. Yep. Yeah. Do you notice that you have a lot of dogs that um, will bark or won't bark a tree. Now, I, I've seen, it seems to me like some dogs are super aggressive at the tree. You know, how do you handle some of that if you have a dog that kind of sits back and watches or some that are actually on the tree trying to climb the tree? Do you do you hold back some of those more aggressive dogs maybe in rockier conditions and don't turn those ones out? Or how do you handle that dynamic? No, typically, because you never really know where they're going to end up. Yeah. You know, so... And that's a, I get worried and I try to leash them up as soon as I can because you mm -hmm. don't want them to get hurt. Yeah. But for the most part, they got to kind of learn to handle themselves in them rocks because you're not always going to be there. Yeah. You know, they may be on that rock for two hours, three hours, you know, without anyone there. And to know not to get too close and either tore up or mm -hmm. slip off. We actually had one cat one time pull the dog off like a 40 foot ledge and they went down tumbling together. down. Yep. Yeah, you know, and. The cat jumped up, took off, and dog busted her up pretty good, broke part of her canine, 
you know, busted her side up, but she was okay, just sore. Yeah, and just took time. Yeah. Yeah. So if we can avoid that, obviously we try to, mm-hmm. you know, times it doesn't happen and yeah. they are stuck by themselves. Yeah. And luckily I don't have many hair pullers, so I'm not dealing too much with vet bills <laughs> and stuff like that. He carries staples around and antibiotics with him 24-7. Yeah. <laughs> so if you ever have a problem, just call Trevor. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. Well, my dad's getting good. Well, he got good at staples there for a little bit. I had a yeah. plot dog. Wanting them plots, they're pretty aggressive, mm-hmm. super strong, and he uh, had to staple one up one time. Yeah, that's not a fun. Stapling dogs is never fun. It's not. No. They, they, that's not a good thing. Um, so, when people go mountain lion hunting, you know, what's the biggest ex- misconception you think that you find with with novice cat hunters? That it's easy. Yeah. You know, they just typically think, oh, you just go to a tree and shoot it, mm-hmm. and it's like. They don't understand A to Z, you know. I mean, you're scaling cliffs. Yogi one time had to pull me up a cliff. Dogs went down, and we were, I don't know, 30 feet, 40 feet. We were quite a ways down, and mm-hmm. we had to get every tie down we had, every cable, tie leashes together. I went down, tied a dog up. He pulled the dog out, and then he had to pull me up out of that cliff too. So it can be really dangerous. It's, I always tell people that hunting in the winter time for cats, bobcats or mountain lions, whatever, is the one hunt that I will not do by myself. No, it's... Like, I, I literally, you know, um, I'm very humbled by the snow and the mountains, and you take that combination, and it, it's, it can be downright dangerous. Um, you know, like, I'm horrible on a snowmobile, and I tend to bury it really easily, and getting out of it, I'm like a little kid, like, Meh, mommy, <laughs> I come out, it's horrible. I, but I would, I, I mean, that's the one hunt that I don't have the confidence. Like, you, you know, if I think about mule deer hunting or elk hunting or doing any really hunting bear hunting whatever um i'll go by myself yeah. no problem but you put snow in a mountain and you put me on a snowmobile or you put me in a truck in the snow game over i want i want help i do not want to do it by myself because things go bad so quickly and the snow conditions make things you know 800 yards oh yeah it's only 800 yards away well you get knee deep or mid thigh deep snow and 800 yards can take you four hours, five hours to get there. Yeah. And it's it's not easy, you know. Um, I, and I don't know, you know, what type of gear you bring, but I've, I've always had, like, on the back of my snowmobile, crampons and snowshoes. If I need them, I've got them. Um, and snowshoes have saved me on some walks. Like, that post-holing through snow is <laughs> No, horrible. it's not fun. It's not fun. You know. No. Yeah, definitely on the sled. Make sure we got a shovel. Yeah. You know, just like little tie down shovel that you could bring with you and same thing like you're talking about you just never know in the snow like no. i'm out there all the time and i'm fairly comfortable and i'm not afraid of it but on that same trip when we had the dog stuck up on the rocks there was a boulder there and i was gonna just push it down because there was a little shoot mm-hmm. and actually i pushed that rock and the rocks i was under standing on gave way too oh, no. and i went down with that rock and it actually rolled back on my leg you know, and it was a pretty big rock. It was a couple hundred pounds, mm-hmm. you know, tore my gaiters, you know, gave me a little bruise and cut. But just something so simple like that that you don't... You don't think about Yeah, you just take for granted. I'll just push this rock out of the way, and it gave way, and it could have been a lot worse. Luckily, yeah. it wasn't. Yeah, it can be. It can be very dangerous. And But I think the best part of hunting out there in the wintertime is the interaction between a houndsman and his hounds. You know, when, when they're out there and they're on a the trail, when they strike it hot their bark changes yep and you know every dog oh no that's molly or that's whoever and they just struck a trail or they just jumped it and you almost know if you're in ear range just by the sound of their bark yeah of what's going on you, you know you're you're using your gps i would imagine you're running like a garmin alpha or something yep. and you see what the dog's doing on there and when you can correlate what you're hearing you know they're almost like people talking to you like yep. you know yeah, exactly what's going on yeah, exactly, and that's what, like these ones when they're on the rocks, you mm-hmm. can tell when they've got either bait on rocks mm-hmm. or on the ground, it's definitely a different Sound. tone in their voice that mm-hmm. they're throwing out. And like mm-hmm. you said, when they're going through, you know, one strikes, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's copper. He's, you know, he's hit it. Mm-hmm. You know, copper and bella, they'll pretty much only strike mm-hmm. when they've got scent. Other dogs kind of tend to run around and just out of frustration or whatever, you know, maybe bark once or twice. Mm-hmm. But if them two have bark, I know that, hey, they've Things hit it, good. you know, we'll head over that way yeah yeah you have confidence in those two 
versus the other ones yep. maybe not as much yeah so do those two do the same thing when you throw them on a on the back of a truck and you're striking for bears are they are they also your consistence on that as well yeah i'm typically not striking much no on the bear you know where we were going it was pretty soft so you could see it in the road mm -hmm. and then just throwing them on the ground you know and then they're just track mm -hmm. track till they get going are now on your bears are you circling the way you would want to circle on a lion pretty much same thing you know, they seem to you know the ones that we've ran have seemed to kept pretty much keep a straight line and if they take a hard line to the you know left or right it's like all right they probably are on it enough to push it to turn that hard mm -hmm. you know so we know they they're right on it you know and then mm -hmm. like i said you can check your gps and they're at 20 or 40 or 60 barks per minute They've obviously have got it jumped and pushing it. Mm -hmm. Things are heated up. Things have gotten hot. <laughs> the dogs are going off. Yeah. So what is your, you know, what is your personal favorite thing about being out there, running your dogs, either with bears or, or, or mountain lions? Just watching them work. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things you, you know, when you talked about people's misconception, they don't understand how hard the dog's working. Mm -hmm. oh. You know, obviously we're working pretty hard too, but them dogs, you know, they may have only went, three miles but they went six back and forth trying to find that track mm -hmm. working it out mm -hmm. yeah and that's exactly why you want to try to circle a track and make sure that they didn't cross the road two miles up yeah you know you wear out your dogs and and it's a lot harder race for them and yeah. ultimately they're your biggest concern and they're they're the one thing you know you're hunting out there with them and you want the best for them and, and they want to give you the best race also yeah and that's like i said when we're <clears throat> got anything on the ground we try to leash up as quick as we can mm -hmm. you know there are times where it ain't as quick as you'd want but mm -hmm. fortunately we haven't had anything too bad happen with cats or bears on the ground you know mm -hmm. the dogs are smart enough and quick enough to get away to where you know it's not too much damage yeah so people that are wanting to get in into you know hunting with hounds I think, you know, a great way for them to start, obviously, is to go with people that have done it a lot yeah. <laughs> and learn from them. Um, buying a hound is like a tremendous commitment. And, and I like in Oregon, hound hunting is only legal for bobcats. And so I, I've been fortunate to do quite a good bit of that um, in Oregon. But, you know, it it's if you've never done it before and you're like, oh, I'm going to get some hounds and move to, um, you know, Montana or, a you know, hound friendly state and just start hunting with them you know it's it's not that easy there is a lot that goes into it yeah and you know like i said i've known guys that have bought paper dogs and thought oh it's from this guy that <clears throat> it's gonna be easy you know yeah. or just turn them out and they go but if you're not turning out on the right track or like you said get on the long end when you could have cut that road two mm -hmm. miles down yeah. and that track is five hours fresher yeah. two miles closer and they just don't know and they turn out on that old track and you run so many old tracks and don't catch and now you're thinking well it ain't too good you know mm -hmm. these dogs are no good or you're just not doing it right yeah. you know and there's a lot of things like said going with somebody who knows mm -hmm. to kind of learn that all right i cut it here i got time i'll go cut make a loop make sure he hadn't come out and then you know he's in there so yeah. then you start right there mm -hmm. and a lot of times i know um one of the most difficult tracks to identify can be bobcats um, you know, it's really easy to mix up in certain snow conditions a bobcat with a coyote. And, yep. and you have to really look at those tracks. And I know that, you know, we've seen quite a few guys dump boxes of dogs on coyotes. <laughs> and you're like, whoopsie, yeah. <laughs> you got that one wrong. Yep. Um, and, and knowing tracks. And, and, and also, I think a lot of it, too, is, is when, you're, when you're driving and you're looking for a fresh track, being able to, to, to move and be able to identify those tracks quickly because, you know, someone like me is a lot more novice. I, it takes me a little bit more time to figure out, is this a coyote, bobcat? What are we looking at? I have to stop and look. You know, you've got this trained eye, um, you know, that'll tell you, I'm sure, almost instantly, you know, what you're looking at, whether it's walking, running. I mean, and all of that takes so many, you know, years of experience to kind of gather and that's that's why hunting with somebody like you is i think really important yeah and like you said it's you know bobcats and you know lions cats tend to step staggered a little bit mm -hmm. to the side you know dogs are pretty much straight in line. line and like you said looking at size and then even glass and you could spot some on the hill like watch follow that track and see where it goes tucks underneath some ledges or trees you're like mm -hmm. all right it's probably a cat if it's staying that low or crossing mm -hmm. under something that low versus you know a coyote or you know a bigger size track 
So what are you looking for when you turn out, like, say, for example, on a mountain lion? You know, what kind of, what characteristics are you looking for in that track versus another track? Just size mainly, you know. Um, other times we seem to, toms tend to drag their feet a little bit. You know, most mm -hmm. cats pick them up and walk without dragging. You know, dogs will typically drag. But usually it seems like a tom will be a little lazier and drag. So if you've got kind of a medium-sized track that could go either way, you know, we found that if it's dragging, it tends to, to be, be a better chance of a tom. You know, not, obviously not always, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're like, yeah, I think this is doing that. I think it has a chance to be a tom. Mm -hmm. And you'll turn out on those versus... Yeah, versus you know, and you then don't. obviously just try to turn out on them, work for the dogs, you know, and not always kill, get to the tree, and a guy decides, hey, you know, it's maybe I'll give it a year. We'll mm -hmm. look for another one and just mm -hmm. move on down the road. So That's what I love about putting a bear or a mountain lion in a tree is you really have a chance to look at it. Yeah. And decide, you know, is this fulfill a harvest objective for the area, for what we want to manage, for, you know, your hunting objectives, and and um, really give that animal, if it needs another year or two, give it to them. Yeah, and that's, you know, like your only true way of actually – seeing size and sex is mm -hmm. Getting putting in a, in a tree where you can see it you know we've mm -hmm. on the bears this year in nevada you know the one actually the kids were in front and brody was in back and that bear ran behind the kids and in between him you know and he's seen watching her up the hill and he's like that's a big bear and any bear lion seems a lot bigger on the ground mm -hmm. you know just walking so they, he's like, that thing's big, you know, and the kids, he told them to come back, so they dumped out and had a treat pretty quick, but then once they got up there, it ended up being a sow. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't know, if you couldn't put it up a tree, yeah. you would have shot it, yeah. and it not be what you thought it was or yeah. what you wanted. So it's, don't, you know, lots of people look down on it, but it's really only for sure 100% way to tell sex on it, male or female. It's a, it's a lot more challenging than people think, and it takes a lot more work than I think the mainstream really, you know, kind of pays attention to and, you know, being able to manage, you know, our predators is so important. Um, our big cats, our big bears, because, you know, in the spring, everything's calving or fawning yeah. and having a good predator prey balance really helps give um, our calf survival rate, our fawn survival rates, a, a lot more of a chance. Yeah. Um, you know, those bears, there's, I have a friend of mine that does a calf, who was part of a calf mortality study in Colorado and, and their number one um, killer of elk calves was, was bears. And, you know, there, you'd have a calf laying out in a field. And, and vegetation growth for the year really also affected that because if the grass was really, really tall, those calves had a lot better time hiding no. versus a, a drought year where there wasn't a lot of vegetation for those young calves and fawns to hide in. But those bears will work, you know, those openings like a grid, just like a scent dog, just like a hound dog, and just work it until they, they cut that scent or they, you know, stumble upon the, the, the fawn or the elk calf and, and, you know, they make quick work of them. And that's why I think, you know, hunting with hounds is, is so important. As a, as a, you know, big game hunter, I really try to hunt a bear every year. I feel like it's kind of my duty. If I want to go out and harvest an elk, I should probably go out and also try to Help put the mount. same yeah. same effort into harvesting bears. And, and then, you know, mountain lions, um, you know, the, the, the they're almost impossible to hunt spot and stalk. With a bear, you can still do some spot and stalking on and, and successfully harvest. Mountain lion is darn near impossible. Have you had any luck or heard of anybody really having any luck doing, you know, like you do with hounds but on foot no you know not seeing them we know a few guys that were calling them and having decent luck calling them and actually on the calls they were using was a woodpecker call mm -hmm. for whatever reason that cat the guys that have called them in said that's the sound they were using woodpecker yeah I see that's the one sound i never would have thought to make would be a woodpecker yeah sound. and okay. i don't know what it is but they've said they've had luck using woodpecker using that sound for whatever reason okay you know, and I've been fairly lucky spotting them, you know, because I'm out so much. Yeah. I think I've probably spotted, seen 25, 27 lions mm -hmm. in the wild just mm -hmm. glassing, you know. Yeah. And fortunately, none of them you would have had a chance to kill because they were quite a yeah. ways on the hill. Good but, ways, yeah. But just glassing and some guys, you know, claim to be able to track them down, which I think you could mm -hmm. if it was fresh enough, obviously. Yeah. I would just follow the track, and once you can get a hillside, just try to glass that track and follow it 
up, you know, and if it quit, you know, okay, I'll focus around there, but mm-hmm. I don't know. Pretty I've tough, always had pretty dogs. Tough, so. Pretty tough way to go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it is. It's not probably the, the most, uh, well, it's obviously not that great of a method because people aren't really doing it that often. It's, no. it's a tough, it's a tough way to hunt and, in the conditions are tough and going with somebody like yourself and that has good dogs that knows what they're doing. That's safe, has good equipment. We're going to have a good experience hunting and, and there, I don't, there's nothing better in my opinion. Well, it's really tough to beat watching a houndsman and his hounds working together. It's a, such a special hunt. Um, the relationship that you build is, is truly remarkable. Yeah. And you know, like I said, I mean, they do become part of the family. Mm-hmm. I mean, you've, had most of them since a pup, you know, for, yeah. you know, if you're lucky, a pup or a dog will make it, you know, 10, 12 years mm-hmm. running in this because it's, it's mm-hmm. a pretty rough life for them, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of mountains, rocks, you know, that's what bad is we get in them dry ground stuff and them rocks, they're real ledgy and, mm-hmm. you know, real sharp rock cuts their pads, you know, but they... They heal up good, and you just take care of it like anything else. Yeah. Or make creams and stuff to help condition your dogs, mm-hmm. you know, kind of toughen up their pads and, mm-hmm. you know, give them a little bit longer life. Hey, everyone. Chances are you'll be hunting in remote areas this hunting season with little to no cell phone service. And because of that, Onyx has a super awesome offline feature that allows you to download and save your maps within the Onyx app in advance of your hunt. Downloading the maps are super easy and it just takes a couple of minutes. So once you're in the field and you're using the Onyx hunt app in the offline mode, it's not only gonna save your battery life, but it's also gonna mean that your maps are always visible and available for your use. Onyx Hunt gives you the freedom to navigate wherever you want to go. And now you can save 20% on your new Onyx Elite membership when you use the code WILD20 during your online checkout. Your family's success with hunting elk is truly remarkable. I mean, we seriously all fall live off of your videos. I mean, you you had a video last year where you you called in a bull, and your client had this bull at like 20 yards, and you finally look at him and you're like, you can shoot it if you want, <laughs> and he's like, I can. <laughs> like he like almost froze. Yeah. He was so excited. You put this thing like in his lap, and it, it, it's just you know the videos you're putting out, the stuff you're doing, the hunts you're doing. Holy smokes. Like, just. I don't want to say come natural, but I've grown up, you know, I've been yeah. fortunate enough. My dad and my uncles, you know, have been in the woods since they mm-hmm. were kids. So I've always been with them. You know, I think mainly what we started out first was trapping. Mm-hmm. Actually, bobcat trapping in the early 80s. You know, I think I was five years old when I picked my first tree and said, I want to sit here and yeah. pop my cat at that tree when I was five years old. So being out there all the time trapping and then picking up sheds, known in Nevada they were the Marx Brothers before we were Bull Ridge it was like hey call the Marx Brothers they follow these elk they name these elk you know we were doing that back in you know late 80s early 90s you were naming elk before naming elk was cool yeah you know (laughs) back then (laughs) people said oh you can't tell that elk from that elk you know they all look the same you know but until you pick up their antlers or they say oh that how do you know that's off of that bull and then you lay the two years together you can see them you know yeah that's that bull Mm mm-hmm no, that's incredible. So your your father started just guiding or outfitting, and then you you learned it from him then? Yeah. Him and his four brothers started the guide service back in 1996. 96. I was 16 years old. <laughs> Not that long ago. No. <laughs> just Just a little <laughs> while ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. Um, I, I feel old now because you're acting like that was a... Like, it just feels like it was just yesterday. Yeah, it was, it's been a while. But like I said, before that, you know, they had always been out picking up yeah. sheds. And then it just come known that, hey, you want to get a hold of or kill a big elk. Mm-hmm. These guys follow them, yeah. name them, get a hold of them. You know, so they had helped a few people out. And so I like, all right, well, maybe we could turn this mm-hmm. into something. So then went ahead and 
started the guide service. Yeah. So you guys, I would assume that there's some kind of generational knowledge that goes with that as well, because it seems to me like the habitat the elk like is the habitat the elk like, and that's a generational behavior um, that goes from one generation of elk to the next, to the next, to the next, and, and they have these zones that they really like. Have you seen that be static, or do you feel like where you live, they can they scatter? Um, it's more weather dependent. Is it you know how? What is your experience? Our our elk don't move much. Yeah. You know that they, they move to rut, but come winter time they don't like migrate. You know I know other places, the North Oregon, mm -hmm. Montana, that Wyoming that they will make a fairly good migration. But mm -hmm. our elk, they just typically move lower in elevation if they yeah. get weather. You know our biggest movement we see is from velvet time to rub to rut. Mm -hmm. We've had some bulls move up to 30 miles to rut from where we hunted them to where we found their sheds, you know, in March, April. Mm -hmm. So that's our biggest movement. And generally, he's going to end up there every year. Yeah. So, if, you know, you hunted him there in the rut this year, he's probably going to be in that same area the vicinity next year. the next yeah. year. So it's a generational movement. Yeah. yeah. They just kind of keep keep the same kind of kind of pattern. I think wolves really affects that to some degree um some big degree in a lot of places they start pressuring but you guys don't have wolves no not yet hopefully yet. we don't get them yeah. but you yeah. know that's another story yeah exactly so you're seeing you know what i've seen in my experience is elk those bulls are higher elevations in in the spring and summer by themselves or in small bachelor groups not, don't necessarily have a high density of elk in those zones and then the cows are kind of in lower more fertile lush easier places to live um and they come together is that kind of the experience where you're at too i mean is that is that the is that the pattern for nevada it, you know in some areas like i said it's just weird how some areas they'll do completely different versus you know the next mountain yeah. range or we'll have bulls that'll summer together on this range one will go rut like a mile away and the other one will cross the valley and go up on the next mountain range mm -hmm. you know we don't know if Sometimes we think, well, maybe they were calved over there is why mm -hmm. they end up over there. But two, yeah, you just don't know. Yeah. Two of them will live, you know, eat the same stuff and one will stay here and one will go 15 miles away. That's un unbelievable. Same mm -hmm. thing with some deer. We got some deer that, you know, the deer we've seen a bigger migration. You know, mm -hmm. we've hunted one buck and he got killed 60 miles away in October with wow. no snow. So he had moved with no snow. So just whenever it was, it clicked him to move he moved and the same buck that we hunted you know in that 800 yards thousand mm -hmm. yards away eating the same stuff he just dropped lower in elevation to two miles away mm -hmm. but you know it's just weird how them deer will do that and our elk just stay in the same spot so you're out there and you're you know you get very familiar then with okay we're gonna go check whatever basin and, and you kind of have a pretty good expectation of what you're gonna see in every spot yeah you know so we know hey this bull made it through he's going to be in there let's try to hunt him or whatever we turned up in summer we know is going to end back up within you know one or two canyons mm -hmm. in that area they're mm -hmm. not moving too much and then so when you're taking hunters out you have a pretty good idea of how old these elk are then too yeah yeah because you've been watching them or for so you know long. if we're lucky we can pick up a few years of sheds so mm -hmm. we know exactly what they are what he's gonna be you know mm -hmm. hey put on 10 inches you know he's gonna be 375 380 you mm -hmm. know and have a really good idea of our guessing by picking up the sheds mm -hmm. is our biggest you know confirmation i guess of what he is there's um the express uu bar ranch has a really really cool um john cade used to work on the white mountain apache indian reservation and he did a really fantastic job of managing their ungulate and predator populations because he was able to kind of free reign do the management because of the location of the white mountain um and he's tried to replicate that on the uu bar and he implemented some really cool studies there where they were picking up sheds and weighing them and then comparing them with harvest um you know what did they what did the elk you know the if when they actually harvested that bull what did it age out at you know and and every elk that they harvest out there they they pull the teeth they study the teeth um and they're you know he's doing a, a really cool study that actually associates the pinnacle size to the age of the bull and i, I really think that that is 
you know, Yogi really talks about this a lot with his roe deer, where, you know, he's like, no, that's a that's an old old buck because you can see, you know, the bases start to curl in and down. They have these gnarly purling around them, and, and you see that with age. And I really think that that's the biggest and best indicator of elk, of their age, is, you know, the ones, the bulls that have those small, thin, you know, bases on them, and then they start to blow up and just mushroom out and... You know, you're probably able to really document that with your sheds every year, too, and get a lot. Like, for you not being a biologist, like, you're really doing wildlife biology in your area. Yeah, we're trying. Like I said, it's obviously age is king in no matter what animal you're hunting. You know, I mean, they don't typically get big as far as just overall size at young age. You know, you may have a good scoring bull that's young, but he's typically going to be, you know, light horned, thin. You know, he's just got point length. But once they start throwing it all together, once they get a few years on him, mm-hmm. then that's when you have a true trophy as mm-hmm. far as he's just giant, mm-hmm. you know. And we've had bulls that put on 30 to 40 inches a year. Wow. Like just them ones typically live, too, in more rockier places. So they're getting a lot more minerals coming off them rocks. Mm-hmm. And you just have a great year, and they've blown up to mm-hmm. our old state record. We have a set off him. He went from 375 to 402 to 442, you know, put on 40 inches in that one year. That's incredible. Yeah. And somebody harvested that bull? Yep. With you? you? Know, yep. That was the old state record we mm-hmm. killed in Nevada. So he grows 442, but he only netted 414 just with the deductions but that bull i don't believe in deductions so i'm just <laughs> gonna put that out there right now i want all the inches to count okay <laughs> like yep. they should all count if the yep. animal grows it he deserves it they're, yeah. they're, they're his yeah and that's where you know we're 50 50 on it because we do like the deduction part of it but then too then we don't think spread should count yeah. it's just there you know it's nothing yeah. just the angle of his antlers means he's bigger because he you know grew at a different angle mm-hmm. but Yeah, so with our bulls being able to grow that, that's what helps Nevada. Mm -hmm. Like our genetics are some of the purest around. Mm -hmm. You know, once, because we got our original elk from Yellowstone Mm -hmm. back, you know, in the 40s or something like that, they Mm -hmm. first brought some over. And they've just absolutely flourished. Yeah, because even Nevada per capita, we aren't even in the top 10 Mm -hmm. with elk. I think there's less than like 17,000 elk in Nevada. But the genetics are there, and, you know, the top end bulls or you know with all the other states you know mm-hmm. that 380 to 410 mm-hmm. you know we've been pretty lucky to kill a few bulls over 430 mm-hmm. in nevada so it's so do you see do they go through that explosive growth that you're talking about to some degree i'm sure all of them do you know you see a a, a spike turn into a a rag five in a year you know or two years it doesn't take a lot of time they put on a lot of a lot of mass a lot of horn is there a, like a breaking point where you, you know you hear a lot of people talk about oh they're regressing in age um oh, this bull is a regressing bull sometimes i feel like i should believe that and other times i'm like man maybe they're not really regressing maybe maybe they're just putting their energy into getting more massive and it's not that their time length is shrinking but maybe it's not going out in length it's just building out in base and, and so it looks different on them I, what is your thought on that it's hard with age because everything's different. You know, yeah. we've had some bulls that peaked at 15. We have one set of sheds my dad has, and that bull actually got found dead, died of natural causes the year after that, and he was aged at 17 plus. Wow. And at 17 plus, he was still 394 gross. Mm-hmm. My dad's set from a year or two before that is 422 gross. Mm-hmm. So He'd lost a little, but not a ton. Yeah. Yeah, you know, from what you think of bulls, some say, oh, their peak's at 9, you know, mm-hmm. 8, 9. But we, like I said, we've had him peak at 15. Mm-hmm. So, and again, he was one that didn't change much in mass. Yeah. You know, he just all length, you know. Mm-hmm. And then, like you said, other ones just tend to grow more mass and lose time length. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's so hard because every bull's different. different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you have, like, um you guys are out there you're living with elk all the time do you have like a great way to help people feel judge elk because i i hear it all the time oh that's a 360 bull that's a 380 bull that's a 390 and and they're these guys that clearly to me seem like they have no idea what they're really talking about most of the time 
poorly judging animals, like is there like a metric? Like, hey, in order to hit 400, you need to have 19 inch brows. You need to have a main beam length of 50 inches. I mean, what is, what is the number to raccolate that to make it happen? I mean, is there a standard you're looking for on an elk? Like when you have something in your binoculars or your optics, you know, what is it that you're looking for to know that that is the combination? Well, just depending on what size you're looking at, you know, so typically like a 350 bull is a really great bull. You know, most people just think, oh, because they didn't hear 400 that it's not big. Yeah. You know, they get a number stuck in their head and we get that with, you know, hunters that we take. Yeah. Hey, I want a 350 type bull. Like, all right, that's fine. So we'll focus on that. And then you go out and you're like, oh, here's some bulls here, you know, and one might be like a 335, 340 good bull. And the guy's like, oh, that's a big bull. Um, you know, shouldn't we shoot it? We're like, no, it's not quite, you know, what you said you wanted. But to him, he it's had no biggest, idea. He doesn't yeah, know. You know. Yeah, he just yeah. heard a number from somebody yeah. and it's like, okay, 350. And you tell him, well, that's not, you know, a 350 bull. And then then they start, well, maybe I don't want a 350 bull mm-hmm. then because that one's big to me, mm-hmm. you know, and I like it. And but So we figure if they've got at least three big points, that they'll probably make 350 mm-hmm. you know so if you've got you like said 19 inch brow and bez mm-hmm. and you know say he's got 15 inch fist mm-hmm. you know which is great back for a bull mm-hmm. you know as long as he's still average on everything else you mm-hmm. know 15 19 you know and 51 inch beams that he'll make 350 mm-hmm. like i said when you're talking 400 that's another beast there of everything's got to come together or he's got to have a lot of extras to make mm-hmm. up for because mm-hmm. typically bulls don't have it all you either got big fronts and small backs or big backs and small fronts. Mm-hmm. You know, the ones that have it, both of them, that's where that's you get your, your monsters. exceptional yeah. monsters. And that's like lots of people see the big fronts and see the small backs and think, oh, drought got them. Mm-hmm. Well, it's they can't have it all, mm-hmm. you know, because you'll have a same bull that's feeding in that same or on that same trail camera that he's the opposite. He's got big, big backs, backs and, and small, small fronts. fronts. And you're so, okay, so what's your logic on that? Mm-hmm. Tell them. You know, did, how did this one have drought in the back and this one doesn't? You mm-hmm. know, it's just genetics. Mm-hmm. You know, it's 90% of it. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So say that again. So you're if you're talking like a 350 bull, you're looking for like a 19-inch fronts, 15-inch royals, and like a 50, 51-inch main beam, beam length. Yeah. Yeah, that you sounds. You know, because pretty much we figured if he's just on average, if you went 15, 15, 15, 19, 12, and 50 with the 27 inch mm-hmm. mass, you know, and a 38 inch in size spread, I think comes up to about right at 350. Mm-hmm. And 38 inches kind of is your, on your spread is your kind of standard yeah. that you just key mark off yeah. of. You know, if we get real lucky and have a wide one, you know, anything 45 or better is like real wide where mm-hmm. we are. You know, most of our stuff, mm-hmm. you know, is there on that. Even we have one bull we killed that was one of them special ones like we were talking about that was 37 inch wide mm-hmm. but he grossed 410. Yeah. You know, he was 19, 24, 23, 23, 17. Had it you all. Know, yeah, he was just the most beautiful mm-hmm. bull you've ever seen, yeah. pretty much, yeah. you know. So you, you're you watching these elk, you, you have your pockets of elk where you know who's living where. When you take a hunter out, if he says, I'll only shoot a 370, do you even take them to the, I mean, do you even like, hey, we should go look at this bull and just show it to him? Or how do you rate that experience? And and do you, like, I have a hard time with the number, the number game. Hey, I have to shoot this or I have to shoot that. I, I'm the kind of person that, like, I, w- I want to see a beautiful animal. Yeah. I want to have a wonderful experience. I want to appreciate the reason that I'm there, which is is to, to give glory to the hunt and the opportunity. I, I I don't live in this world, but you live in this world of people are really fixated on this number. I mean, how do you handle those situations? Because it's it's a foreign thing to me, really. Yeah, I, and it's hard just because, like you said, you know, most of these guys don't know the number that they're trying to see. They're just you know? hearing it on TV yeah. or a podcast or something. Yeah, right? you know, or then you got the media. other, the flip side of it, the guy that's killed 15 bulls, mm-hmm. 20 bulls, and wants that number. And then you kind of, like you said, all right, we'll go up where we know these bulls are that should be this size. Yeah. And if you can't find them, then you just obviously try to find the best thing yeah. you can and say, hey, this this is what he is. We don't think he's 370, but, you know, he's 360, 362. Mm-hmm. You know, do you want him or not? You know, because if mm-hmm. not, when you find that type of bull in the rifle hunts in Nevada, not broke, 
we say, all right, if you don't want him, that's great, but we're going to try to get a hold of another hunter and come in because we know yeah. that they would. Mm -hmm. You know, we had one guy one year, he said, like you said, one to 375. So, all right, so we go find a bull. We actually seen him before the season, and we thought, hey, he probably is. So one of our other guys took him up there, and they had him, you know, there 100 yards looking at him. Well, he said he didn't like the way he looked. So now you got a number, but he don't like the way he looked. So, all right. So another guy finds another good bull, and he says, oh, I like that one. I'd shoot that one. And he said, well, we don't think he's 375. So it's like, oh, okay, well, let's still try. I'm like, all right, that's good. But so now is it a look you want or is it or a number you want? Number like, you're looking for. You know, so then that's your problem that you run into them guys. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. no pleasing. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard because you find one that's the number he wants, but he don't like the way it looks. Mm -hmm. So then you find one that's not the number he wants, but he says he would try for it. Yeah. So then you find another bull that's the number he said he would shoot, but then, oh, it's not 375. Yeah. So it's... You it just could get be out a there little, and do the best you can. Yeah, you know, you just turn up bulls and, you know, that guy, we probably had in range, you know, five bulls that were 368 to 375. and He just didn't like them. Yeah, you know, so that, it gets hard, you know, it's a lot of time spent and energy mm -hmm. when the next hunter would have loved to have oh, been yeah. in range of any of those, mm -hmm. you know, and would have taken them, mm -hmm. but... It it's, comes with the game. That's exactly right. I um, you know, I drew that book clip steer tag this year, and um, that was the first time I, I, apart from when I had my Dutton tag, um, that was the first time I looked at. There's only two times in my life I've looked at animals with that optic of, okay, is this does this hit that number? Yeah. Um, and that that was really hard for me because there was a lot of animals that, man, I just. I like to hunt and have a great experience, and, and, and I want to be out there with my husband and my fa my father and my friends, and and um, I, I just love appreciating the experience. But, you know, when, when you draw a tag like that, when you have the opportunity to come hunt Nevada or, or hunt with you, you know, you've waited 15, 18, 20 years for that hunt. I mean, you want to get the, the best you can. I mean, you want to shoot that 14 year old bull. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the pinnacle of, of, you know, that animal's at the very end of his life, you know, and you know, that is a true trophy. I mean, it's a remarkable thing to, to be able to accomplish and, you know, looking for that. I mean, I, I get it. it it's just, yeah, it, it yeah. it's hard. Cause then you're like, well, I've waited 14 years <clears throat> Here's the biggest bull I would have ever killed. In my life. But now do I pass him and try yeah. this next, you know, step up? Yeah. And lots of guys gamble and it works out, you know, but there are times where it doesn't. Yeah. You know, you get guys that, well, we'll save him or we'll mm -hmm. come back for him. But that hardly ever works mm -hmm. out when you try to come back and find him in a day or two. And, you know, so it's... it's what just, do you attribute your success to mostly? Do you, do you think... It's in your scouting, your knowledge of the bulls, your knowledge of their behavior, that that more um, that that preseason stuff, or, or is your success mostly in your calling strategy? And I mean, what what do you what do you think? It's mainly the pre scouting <coughs> and you know the scouting of the year before mm -hmm. of hey we still know that these two bulls are alive, mm -hmm. you know because it's hard when you're hunting when you're guiding everything so. Before the elk season, we're still deer hunting. Yeah. So we don't get two weeks before the elk season to scout. You know, we're still deer hunting, and then we roll right into elk. And they're not necessarily in the same yeah. places. Yeah, so it's like, all right, we could have spent two, three weeks and found something, but if he ain't there two days a day before the season, like, not that it didn't do us any good, but now we're just stuck. Where's he at? You know, mm -hmm. and you're wasting a lot more time trying to relocate to one where we can cover more ground the day or two before the season hopefully turn up you know two or three bulls and say hey you know we've got a couple to pick from take video and show the guy hey these are the bulls that are out there you know does what's he look like mm -hmm. um but on the flip side when we're scouting or deer hunting and we have a bull found it kind of worked out so the first bull of the season i killed this year with the guy me and my nephew had found him scouting while we mm -hmm. were deer hunting two weeks before that mm -hmm. so i took video of him you know, showed the guy and said, hey, you know, this is the bull that's up there. Yeah. 
you know, the bulls we found the day before the season, every one of them had at least one point broke. Mm -hmm. So I said, this one was still intact. If you want, we could hike up there first thing in the morning. And if he's there, you know, look at him and decide from there. But he's what we've seen. If you want a good intact bull, here's one to mm -hmm. take. And, and it worked out. We hiked up there first thing in the morning and first hour of daylight, he shot him and, you know, took home a 360 type bull just to perfect good looking Nevada bull not broke but your guys' success is coming from being in the woods literally year round you're you're in there in January you're in there in February you're in there in the spring shed horn hunting picking up learning where these elk are wintering figuring out where they're riding I mean you <clears throat> you almost live with them in a way yeah and and that's why you know you're so successful it's it's not and I it's really hard to be a public land hunter and be successful on your own when you go out for a weekend. Yeah. You know, you, okay, I've got a weekend to go hunting, and it's it's really tough. It makes it a lot harder if you don't have that time to commit to, you know, being out there and, and learning the things that you're learning by being out there, you know, 24-7 basically. Yeah, you know, and now that I have kids, I don't spend as much time, but I honestly was probably in the woods for I don't know, 300, 320 days yeah. a year, you know, just because mm -hmm. we're scouting, you know, July, mid-June to July, August, we start hunting. Mm -hmm. August till December, we're hunting. Mm -hmm. And then we start lion hunting from January, February, March, and we start picking up sheds from April, May, and mm -hmm. then maybe have, you know, May, June off if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. So we were, yeah, typically out there all year, and then we've obviously got great help. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone that helps us, guides with us, knows what they're doing, you know. And if they can't or if you're unsure, we're like, just make sure you get video. You know, as long as we can pick through the video and look through, it's like, yeah, he's worth a second look. Let's go hike up there in the morning and get a better look. Mm -hmm. But it definitely isn't just solo. I mean, everybody puts in their work, and yeah. that's what's helped us be where we're at. Yeah, you got a good team. Yep good team of people and and you guys are like literally living the lifestyle with them so give us a couple quick just calling tips like you do a lot of elk calling during the rut what's your like go-to do you have a go-to I know that's a horrible question to ask because as a, I mean I do a lot of elk calling but you know what's what's a typical call set for you our elk honestly or I wouldn't say call shy, but it's tough to pull a bull off his cows. You yeah, know. well, that's everywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think know. that that's just in Nevada. Yeah, so typically we don't, like, pretty much everything spot in stock. You know, yeah. we'll call to locate, and if you're lucky when you're calling, if you see some interest, then you can keep calling. But I think a lot of guys will tend to overcall. Mm -hmm. You know, especially when you're in somewhat of an open setting. Yeah. Like, when they don't see anything, they they're not wrong. coming. Yeah, they're mm -hmm. like... No, nothing's over there. Yeah. I'm going the other way. So we'll typically try to call enough to get them to move. And even if you can get them to move a little bit to where you can maneuver and try to cut them back off going back towards his herd. Because mm -hmm. we've had a lot of guys that, you know, kept trying. And you're like, hey, just settle down. Yeah. You know, he's not going to come. No. So the more we're calling, it's just raising more suspicion of, you know, yeah. what's around or what's not around to them. So I we had a really big bull actually got some video on my instagram of that and he we figured he was like 4 30. Mm -hmm. you know like nine by ten but in the videos you could watch us call and he would come to the edge look down bugle look for you yep and would not come any mm -hmm. close turn around go back mm -hmm. you know you wait a little bit call again he would turn come back and look but he was not coming no. without seeing anything down no. there and i don't blame him no no you know yeah especially when they have cows it's like why am i gonna leave a cow you know to go find another cow the biggest bull i've killed with a, a bow i watched him on a skyline and i'm like man come over break over because <laughs> if he went on the other side we were going to go up and over and chase him but i knew once he broke over the skyline and he got he lost some elevation there was some some pinions in the bottom i'm like if he can lose some elevation and get in those pinions then i can call yeah. Because then he can't see. Yep. And he's going to look out of curiosity more so than if he's standing up there skyline, bird's eye view, looking down on me. He's going to know instantly things aren't right, you know. Yep. And that's what elk do. You know, they'll hang up at that 80 yards and look. You know, they'll come into a point, and if they look around and they don't see what they think they should see, you know, they're not, they're not going to yep. commit. Exactly. And that's, like I said, a lot of them, like you said, everywhere, you know. Yeah. 
they're smart enough to know that, hey, I'm not just going to blindly go in the open to just a sound, you yeah. know. Once they can catch a cow moving, then, mm -hmm. all right, you know, I'll full commit. But mm -hmm. other than that, yeah, they're just holding up in that open stuff. So you guys are doing a lot of locating and then a lot of moving, getting in close. Yep. You know. It's a strategy I'm a firm believer in. If you can get them to locate and get as close as you can, do it. Yeah, as quiet as you can yeah. without knowing because they're always going to, yeah. you know, be looking for, hey, there's something over there. Where's mm -hmm. it at? And mm -hmm. once nothing comes out, it's like, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's all. This is all super interesting. Um, any other big, like, takeaways, tips other than get out there and scout for people if they want to be successful oh, finding big elk? For big elk, we've, like, if you see any cows around, I'm not saying there's not going to be, but chances are a bigger bull isn't going to be. Once he's done with the rut, he doesn't want anything to do yeah. with cows. You know, we've had even other bulls come by, and the bull's not like it. You know, I've had... We were muzzleloader hunting. We had a, you know, 350 type bull bedded down 300 yards away and we were just waiting him out for him to get up and start feeding again so we could start making our move. Where we're waiting and all of a sudden this little raghorn, like a three point, you know, a two, three year old bull comes over the hill and starts just feeding towards him and that comes by that bull and that bull didn't like it. He got up and fed over, just didn't feed. He just got up and went over the hill. He just didn't want to yep, deal he with didn't it. Want he to was be done. Him. Yep. And same thing with another time was hunting. 370 type bull and he had three other mature bulls with him and there was a group of spikes mm -hmm. down low well anytime them spikes would go up high where them ones were they would go low mm -hmm. they wouldn't you know get in that group they would always be in a different spot than them mm -hmm. ones they didn't want anything to do with them yeah. younger ones so you know typically they're going to be with older mature bulls mm -hmm. you know and not around cows yeah. you know Post lots, yeah lots of time guys yeah. They bury themselves in a hole by themselves, and they don't move a lot a lot of times. Yeah. You know, if they've got food and water and cover, and they'll yeah, they don't need just to. rest and recover. Yep, and that's what we tell a lot of guys, too. Like, <clears throat> And sheep guys don't want to hear it, but you can say you can luck into a bigger sheep than you can an elk or deer. Mm -hmm. Just the way the sheep move, you know, mm -hmm. they just all of a sudden get up and head over yeah. two, two draws, you know. But like you said, an elk, he could stay in that pocket for a week or a month. Yeah. And, and not, not have to move. You know, he's got food and water and cover. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in that hole, you may not see him. No, no. And that makes, it, I think, a lot of rifle hunts, later rifle hunts, really challenging depending on the terrain. You know, if you have a lot of oak brush and it's got leaves and stuff on it, man, they can just, they love eating it. Yeah. And they get in there and they just bury themselves in it and can't be bothered. Mm -hmm. And even yeah. when you know a bull's there, so one year we were hunting a pretty big muzzleloader bull. A guy shot at him last day of the season. We missed him, so like, all right, we know he's in here. For two weeks, us and some other hunters that knew he was there too could not find him. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, one day, we see these guys, they had him killed, and they're like, oh, yeah, he was right down in the bottom by the creek, you know, just somewhere where you couldn't see. Yeah. And he had stayed there for that long and mm -hmm. made it a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. But it's ironic, even times when they're right out in the open, they make it. You know, we had one bull this year. We finally killed him, but... We had these depredation hunts and we tried hunting them then. Never got him killed, so he made it through three depredation hunts and the early rifle hunt in the flat. And he made it that long and he was 375 type bull. Wow. You Just know, in, in plain sight. Yep. Yeah, you know, and people were either around him or kind of hunting him, but he just made it through and we yeah. lucked out and finally went down there that morning and got caught him, him coming up and mm -hmm. got him killed. But. So sometimes it's blind luck that he makes oh, it, yeah. or other times it's because he's knowing what he's doing. The biggest bull I've ever shot was was with like 75 cows the day before, and he peeled off with a five by five, and they were just done. They they literally left all the elk. We went back to find him, and and we weren't getting eyes on him, and we're like where did he go? You know, and like he's just done, and he went you know by himself and laid down, and we found the five by five and. Man, I laid in a snowbank for four hours because they had been together. And I'm like, this guy's he's gotta be he's there. gonna be here somewhere. And yeah. he finally stood up and came out to feed and I got him and he was the, the poorest looking animal I've ever taken him. I don't know that he would have made it through the winter. The ticks on him were so bad. Um, I think they'd have killed him, honestly. Like, right. cause those ticks will really, I mean, uh, and it doesn't sound like a lot of people 
like a tick doesn't kill an elk. A tick will absolutely kill an elk. Mm -hmm. um, when they're worn like that and they get a bunch of them on them and, and they're sick, you know, they just they just get wore out and the ticks just literally will suck the life right out of them. And then, you know, a lot of times too, when they get them that bad, then they rub all the hair trying yep. to get them off. And then exactly. That's it, then they exposed. get cold. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that one, this one had no hair. I had to actually get a different cape. He had so, the ticks were so bad on him. He'd rubbed all his hair off. I don't think he, I don't, he, his hip bones were sticking out so bad. I, I've never seen an elk so thin. I, I don't think he'd have lived. Didn't made it. Yeah. No, he might I just not don't, have. I just don't. And I don't know how old he was. We know we never aged him or anything, but, um, it is, it is, they're an incredible animal, you know, the, the way they think, the way they change throughout different cycles of the year and the rut and how they act. And, um, it's, it's one of those animals that's absolutely fascinating to me. And I, I don't think that there's anything more intoxicating to hunt than an elk. I don't, no, I've, there is. I've hunted everything, not everything, but I've hunted a lot of animals and there, there's nothing that beats elk hunting. No, I agree, because that's all I'm fixated on, yeah. you know, like guys are like, oh, big deer, big, you know, sheep. It's fun, but there's nothing like walking yeah. up on a 400 type bull, yeah. like. Yeah, well, I've not done yeah. that yet, Trevor, so, um, <laughs> Yogi, you better draw Nevada. <laughs> He's yeah. getting close. He's, He's getting close. Gonna get he close. He probably will. He's going to draw it soon, and we're going to hopefully have the chance to get out there in the woods with you. And yeah. um, I just really love, and I'm so thankful that you sat down with me, because I love, you know, you have. You have so many incredible experiences, and I, I want to learn from you. You know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to go hunting with you with, with your hounds for elk one day. Heck, I'd love to come down and pick up horns with you and just to listen to the, the things that you have to say and, and the knowledge that you have about wildlife that you don't even know. Like, the things that you take for granted, it's, uh, like, you don't even realize how much knowledge you have, I don't think, you know, at times. So you're just like, oh, yeah, this is just how it is and you probably don't think about yeah, it like i said it's been fortunate to yeah. spend you know as many years as i have in the field and yeah. you know 20 years of guiding mm -hmm. you know it's crazy to think of that but mm -hmm. it's been 20 years of guiding and like i said i i like it just because it's something new every day mm -hmm. like it's not your nine yeah. to five it's oh. you never know what's going to happen that's why we love our life yeah you know our life is new every day and we're always on a new adventure and we do get to explore so much and and you know, I don't think that there's anything more amazing than being outdoors and, no. and spending time in the woods. And, um, you know, that's that's why we do what we do. And, and we love we love wildlife and we love those wild places. And um, it's it's incredible just to be out there and see animals like that. And I've not laid eyes on elk to the caliber that you've laid eyes on. And, and I mean, just just being out there with them the few times that I've been at the caliber that you're out with and you that you live with year round to me is just it's just oh I'm like awestruck like literally we have like this Instagram thing did you see what Trevor posted today did you it's 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 never ending in our house you're the topic of conversation constantly so and I'm sure you are that way if people want to follow you on social media how can they find you on Instagram or Facebook, you know, just Bull Ridge Guide Service. Mm -hmm. Just search that and it'll pop up. Our website, you know, same thing, just Bull Ridge Guide Service and it'll mm -hmm. show up. I, you know what I really appreciate about you is you're so humble about, you know, what, what you've helped hunters accomplish. You know, you have helped so many people really fulfill their dreams. And, you know, a lot of those dreams are not once in a lifetime. They're once in five lifetimes or more and the, to, to, for you to be able to consistently do, go out there and do that and have those experiences with people that really are our lifetime memories is, is super awesome and, and you know thank you for sharing your time with me today and thank you for sharing your time with with the audience yeah, no problem well, thank you for having, having me oh I no i'm super it. stoked you're over here with these deer heads i'm like oh trevor <laughs> come sit down <laughs> like you're gonna do this now so anyway thank you guys for joining us for this episode of the wild and uncut podcast thank you trevor again i i really can't say thank you enough and i hope you guys have enjoyed this episode from uh hunt expo all right thank you yeah Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.